Hey, Maniacs, just a little note here before we begin. We learned something really fun after we recorded this episode, so we wanted to put it right here at the top. My brother, who we mentioned in the episode, sent me a text about Murdoch Mysteries Murder in F Major, which Ooh. is on Friday the 10th and Saturday the 11th of March in Roy Thomas Hall, the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, Yannick Basson and Johnny Harris. Oh, wow. Crabtree and Murdoch. We're we'll going to host it. We'll be playing Murder in F Major. Well, they're not going to play. No, they won't play. But they, they, they'll they introduce it. Maybe. Yes, Lucas Walden is the guy conducting it. But Awesome. So if you're in Toronto or near Toronto, you should check it out. And let yes, us know. Absolutely. What's the website to find out more? www.tso.ca. All right. On with the episode then. On with the episode. <laughs> Mystery Maniacs. Mystery Maniacs is a comedy recap podcast dedicated to mystery TV. Each week, we dig into an episode of the show, including the murders, the mayhem, the loonies, and everything else we love. This week, we're covering Murdoch Mysteries, Season 1, Episode 2, The Glass Ceiling. Mm Mm-hmm. You're Mark, and I'm Sarah. Yes, and welcome back, all the new listeners. We we definitely picked up some listeners last time, and I'm- Welcome back, OG Maniacs. OG Maniacs. Maniacs. <laughs> we definitely got some maniacs who were like, I've never seen this show before, including one person who was like, I live in Toronto. I've never seen this show before. I feel guilty as a Canadian. <laughs> but I love it when you cover it. They're going to take your card back, your Canadian yep. membership card, I think. But more than anything, to. I want to cover that we are now Dave Bell approved. Oh, your brother listened. My brother listened to the podcast. My oldest brother listened to the podcast and said, good job. His approval is important to you, it, isn't well, it? It's extremely important to me. <laughs> so, it's, Yo, big bro. Uh, yeah, and Dave and Peg watch Murdoch pretty regularly and try not to spoil it for us because they get the episode six months before us. Yeah. And they're like, oh, that, oh. I can't tell you that. Yeah. (laughs) Don't tell me. Ah. One correction from last week. I think I mistakenly said that Coronation Street was set in London. It's set in Manchester. Thank you to those of you who corrected me on that. Yes, and we're not the kind of podcast who was like, oh, you, you, uh, Thank you for pointing it out. Oh, no. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Uh, We also, uh, Talbot Trail, who is one of the admins of the Murdoch Appreciation Society on Facebook, also gave us some interesting tidbits, including Maureen Jennings loved Helena Joy so much in the movies. That's why she's in the show. Good. It was a good choice on on Maureen's part. And I like her. The, the first episode that we covered, Power, is actually one of the later ones filmed. And that this was actually the first episode, The Glass Ceiling, but they moved the order around, which is absolutely common. Yeah. Happens all the time. But it makes a lot of sense because in Power... They just kind of dive in, like assuming you know who everybody is. It's a little better here. And in this one, you get a little bit more context of who people are, which is helpful if it's a new show to you. Absolutely. Uh, Just to cover once again, this is a spoiler podcast. And if you let your kids put ice over dead bodies and uh, and sawdust, they'd probably be able to listen to the podcast. They can more than handle this. Though Brackenreach says prick. Whoa. I know we have to talk about that. I think his violence in this episode is a bit more offensive than his language. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Lastly, before we begin the episode, I have another... Why don't we live in England story? (laughs) So Lucy Worsley, who we've talked about on the podcast several times, she's a television historian. Now, she is a a true academic. She is the chief curator of royal palaces, I think. At least she was. the last title I heard of her, yeah. Uh, She has a new book out called Agatha Christie, A Very Elusive Woman. Now, we've covered some Agatha Christie shows on Mm -hmm. on the podcast before. And we love Agatha Christie, and uh, Lucy's going to do a tour of all over England to talk about this book. And I just think it's horrible that 
there is a hall for Cornwall in Cornwall, and she's going to go talk at this hall for Cornwall in Cornwall, and we cannot go to that. <laughs> the second best thing, though, is that she did do a limited series podcast for BBC Sounds where she reads part of the book. Okay. I listened to a couple of those already. That's cool. Yeah. She kind of makes over Archie Christie, Agatha Christie's husband. Makes like, over him. Like, he was handsome. Really, oh. like he was. I think she says he was hot. <laughs> I was like, Lucy. <laughs> That's all right. So we're covering the glass ceiling today. Originally broadcast January twenty seventh, two thousand eight. Sean Thompson directed this particular episode and written by Gene Gregg and Cal Coon. Oh, there's so much good in this one. We get to see Henry. Yes, we do. Henry. If you've never seen Murdoch, you don't know about Henry. He's just another constable in this episode. You don't know. No, he's not even mentioned by name, I don't think. No, I I think somebody does say Henry. Uh, I think somebody does say his name. But you you don't know that he's going to be in every episode. I'm frankly, I'm just glad that I'm prepared for... For now, because I spent five hours at the dentist yesterday. <laughs> I thought I was never going to get out of there. <laughs> we've, we've had a rough two days and my foot and Sarah's teeth. It, Man, I had two definitely... root canals yesterday. Yeah. It was nice to just sit back last night and watch Murdoch for the umpteenth time. I went to a hockey game. If you follow my Instagram, you see I took a bunch of kiddos to the hockey game and had a good, hotel, good time in Indy. Well, I, I sat home on painkillers. <laughs> Eating soft things. <laughs> and the dog put, it, put herself to bed. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so, you know, last week when we covered the first episode, we didn't really talk about the credits. Mm-hmm. And there's a little bit, and first of all, I think, I mean, we talked a little bit about him in the music, but that wooden doll in the chair with the gun has always creeped me out. And it's a precursor to the belly talker episode that's coming up. Yeah, but the chair rotates so that the doll's in view and its hand is like right next to the gun. Oh, it's creepy. (laughs) It is indeed creepy. I've brought you here, Mr. Bond. You know, like... (laughs) I just, every time I wait for it to move, I kind of expect it to move. So Bracken Reed is at a Canadian Police Association lunch. He's the guest speaker. He's supposed to be talking about this awesome locked room mystery. So two things before we begin into that. We see two city shots here. Yeah, I don't know. That first one, it doesn't make any, it's like an illustration. It's a completely different color scheme. It doesn't look right. I don't get it. It's a photograph. And I found that photograph Oh! because I looked up Booth and Son painters and glazers and I actually found that photograph. You going to put it in the show notes for us? Uh, it's, I'll put it in the show notes. It's of the corner of Adelaide and Victoria Streets, which I absolutely walked past on my way to go to get my first. When I got my first internet provider in Toronto, I had to go to their office to get the disc <laughs> to install. <laughs> The internet. Back in my day. <laughs> well, that makes sense. But then. there's a beautiful park on Adelaide that yeah. that's right near, and uh, there's a really good Indian restaurant there. <laughs> oh, there used so, to be. Like, guess, it makes sense then that they would include it, even though yeah. it doesn't really match. It's a historical image. Yeah. So, so kind of sets so the, the scene. So there's there that, and then there's this whole collection of police chiefs, right? And one of the things that... There's way too many of them for that room, by the way. Yeah. One of the things we mentioned in our little preview video reel that we did is that we were going to talk about the chief of police of Toronto. Mm. And we didn't do it last episode, but this is a perfect spot to talk about him. H.J. Grasset would have been the uh, chief of police at this time. Mm -hmm. He was chief of police from 1886... To 1920. The changes he saw like 35 in police years? are incredible. So he over Like when he started, it was traffic laws for horses. And yep. when he finished, it was traffic laws for cars. So he saw the institution of the electronic call box and signaling system, patrol wagons, bicycles, motorcycles, and ultimately police cars. And, and World War One, And reorganized all all of the morality squads and created the first department of def- detectives. Murdoch would have been in awe of this guy. Yeah. Absolutely. Like it. So, so that what, was, a, what a fantastic life that he oversaw. So that's the real guy, the, the character chief Stockton. Yes. 
he of the eyelashes. Do you notice his eyelashes? Yeah, he has some eyelashes. I don't know if they put mascara on him, but he's got like electric blue eyes and long eyelashes. And I hate him from the very first shot of him. Like, I don't like you. I'm not going to like you. And I, I felt that way the first time I saw it, too. You can just tell. Yep. Like, now, mm, you're acting nice, but you're not. They also do a fun thing here because anyone who studied electricity or any electrical engineering knows that there's always somebody who's like, well, what's the difference between a battery and a capacitor? Yeah. There's definitely... <laughs> and poor Bracken Reed yeah. tries to explain it. <laughs> and you know that Murdoch has prepped him. Like, he's got notes. He's referring to his notes. But the question they're asking him is not in his notes. <laughs> no. So Murdoch takes over. I can't tell whether the the audience in that room, whether they're happy Murdoch took over or they're like, oh, my God, this man is so pedantic. We do well, not care about all of this. Also, I think that one of the things in this episode that may have stopped them from making it the first episode is the fact that Murdoch's religion comes up in this. Mm -hmm. And so all those men were likely Protestant. Mm -hmm. Somebody would have known that Murdoch was Roman Catholic and would have kind of been poo-pooing him there. So if this took place in Quebec, would it have been different at this time? Wouldn't there have been far more Catholics there? Very different. Okay. That's be, what I thought. Been completely different. Yeah. They talk about the, the Leyden jar versus the battery and where the charge comes from. And, and Murdoch just, he doesn't say, well, I know this because I read a lot and I research a lot and I'm interested in this. He says, it just comes to me. Yeah. Like he just has these brain waves. No. <laughs> and he does a lot of work. He's piecing together all the stuff that he knows. He does know? have a skill of a wide range of reading and interest that, yeah. that sometimes come together. And that's kind of his character. Yeah. He's a, what do they call it? A polyvore? Somebody who likes all kinds of information. Yes. You know? Absolutely. So then we get the trunk. Oh, So they go back to boy. the station this and there's a trunk. This is another reason why this couldn't be the first episode. Yeah. Because you introduce this show to a new audience who's never seen it before with a contorted naked man right off the bat. Like, that's a lot. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but second episode, okay, naked dude in yep. a box. I am so impressed with whoever plays this cadaver and i looked and looked and looked and could not find out who is, it is. another anonymous fantastic naked cadaver man yes just there's like one in midsummer also <laughs> the guy in midsummer who's in uh, the crop circle yep he's excellent but this person well first of all it's a different person on the slab later in the morgue yes than the person in the box yeah that that that's we know that's true but whoever this man is who's in the box, he is a contortionist first and yeah. an actor second, okay? Because the way he is folded up is incredible. My notes say, good dead body, no butt crack. Yeah. <laughs> he is absolutely nude. He might have one of those little G-string pouchy things on that kind yep. of, not even a G-string, because that would have something that goes around your waist. It kind of has adhesive on it. <laughs> But Something. Like, even, no matter what, this is one brave man. He's got makeup on from head to toe to yep. make him look pale. Absolutely. And corpse like, and the way he's bent makes it look like he's been beheaded. His head is so tucked up under his arm. I was sitting on painkillers last night watching this, trying it because nobody was around. <laughs> like, can I put my head under my arm? I can't. I cannot do that. The dog must have looked at you like, Oh, she do doesn't do? care. Are you kidding? <laughs> Olive's like, whatever. As long as you don't come over here and try to take my blanket, I don't care what you're doing. Do you have food? No. Okay. So stupid. this is this is our first scene of crime, and it's Percival Pollock. Yes. Yes. Percy. Percy. Um, all folded up with a note. I love that we get to see the way the note writer writes the letters out with the ruler. Yep. Because nobody writes like this. I, I'm completely enamored with all topography, so that was fantastic. It looks almost like runes. Yeah, it looks like, like runes. Fufark, like yeah. Viking runes. When I was taking my notes, I tried to write out the first few words in the same style, and it's really hard to write that way. Yeah, I can imagine. But dear Inspector Bracken Reed, have you missed me? Percy did. I paid him a visit. Ooh. Okay, now we spoil everything, right? Yep. So we know that Birkins, Dr. Gilbert Birkins, Dr. Gilbert is behind the scheme, but he's not the killer, right? Ayat is the killer. 
So let's just talk this through from the beginning. Yeah. Because I have issues with understanding it. Okay. So Percy invested in Birkin's motorcycle business, but yes. started to get cold feet. Yes. And so Birkins thinks I got to kill him so that he can't cancel the wire transfer of the money that I need. Yes. Right. He already knows Ayat. Because he saved him. He, in he, the he Don let people jail think fire. he was day He was dead. Right. We'll, we'll get to the Don jail. Yeah. yeah. And he, th he wants Ayat to just scare Percy, but he kills him instead. Yeah. Puts him in a trunk, writes a note and has it delivered to the police station. <laughs> And Birkins isn't like, wait right there. Yeah, like, Ayat's pretty off the bed. <laughs> Ayat, who so we never see, except who, in a photograph. Who, who is also incredibly mechanically inclined, because that booby trap he creates is fantastic. Oh, we'll talk about that when we get there. Birkins thinks Ayat's just going to scare him. He yeah. winds up killing him instead. Birkins knows that. Right? Well, who's the body in the ice that they find? That's Ayat. Okay, so that's, that's the only time that's we the see only him. Time we see him. But Birkin must have been like, "Wait a minute, you killed him. You shouldn't have done that." And Ayat's like, "I got an idea. I'm going to put him in a box and send him to an inspector and the police." And Birkins must have been like, "No, no. <laughs> stop. Oh, and I'm going to go kill this judge too." No. No. <laughs> If Ayat had never killed the judge, we would have never known it was Ayat, right? That's yep. what gives you the pattern. Yeah. Ayat just has to mess with Brackenreed. He's he can't be happy with what he's done, and that's what unravels the whole thing, right? So Birkins should have stopped him right then and there. Yeah. But he doesn't. And I think this is a precursor to things that we love later in this episode with sequential killers. Which is what they called serial killers in the show. So we get to see Henry here. He's a baby. He's a baby. <laughs> Everybody's a baby at this we point. We also have another constable who's staring directly at the camera. <laughs> uh, the background actors are so great in the police station. I highly encourage, if you've seen it before, just don't look at the main characters and look around the background because they have so many people in police costumes hustling and bustling, trying to look like they're up to something. And sometimes they're just not very good at no. it. <laughs> Speaking of which, the two undertakers who work for Julia yep. and haul the body out of the trunk to put it on the, the gurney, one of them, like, his jacket is just, like, blown out on the side. Yeah. Like, his armpit is just ripped out. I'm assuming that they had a costume that didn't fit him or... It fit too tightly, and when they moved the body a couple of times... It ripped, it out. ripped out. And they just thought, yeah. oh, well, he's not a highly paid guy. He might have a ripped jacket. Maybe. Because <laughs> the rest of the time you see him in the morgue, he's not wearing a jacket anymore. He's no. just got his shirt and an yep. apron on. So it's okay. But it's totally blown out. <laughs> I must have, like... Okay, now we need you two to rip to, to pull this body out of the trunk, and he goes to reach for him and rip. Yep. <laughs> You're like, um, let's just roll with it because the poor guy it. who's playing the body really doesn't have time for us to go and sew your jacket up and oh, alter it and come back guy. while he's naked in yeah. a box. He would have been naked all day. <laughs> I would have had a robe on. Spoke. <laughs> if it didn't wipe the makeup off, I guess. Wow. Wow. Anyway. So they go visit Clara and there's some better, sh like this whole scene is better shot and acted than... I yes, finally, the camera backs up. Maybe the whole first episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because... But it's then it's suddenly back to the closeness. It, sometimes, but it seems to be a little bit more purposeful in this episode. Yeah. Which is interesting if these aren't shot in... They're not in order, so they start by shooting at reasonable distances and then later decide to get really close and then back up again in other episodes i don't know but the so clara is pollock's widow and bracken reed knows her well right because bracken reed and pollock have worked on many cases yes. together he knows the housekeeper he knows molly the housekeeper clara goes and throws herself in the yard by the clothesline and to me it looks like this is a different house than the one they walk into yeah it definitely the front is. and the back yeah. are really different there would not surprise me if it's two different filming locations i've seen and enough of those stone built kind of cottagey farmhouses to know they were stone all the way around it wasn't like a mcmansion subdivision the way we do it now and put brick on the front and siding on the back 
And I also think that this could easily be a second unit director doing this part. Mm. So that's why it looks a little different than the first unit. It's go- I mean, it's good, though. Yeah, it's absolutely good. I mean, I understand why she's upset. And we're off to Mimico. So where is Mimico? Mimico is west of Toronto at this time, about 10 miles west. Okay. So at this time, it's part of the place that starts with an E. Etobicoke. Etobicoke. I wanted to say Enochian. That's not it. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's completely different. Etobicoke was its own little village city. Etobicoke and is a little further out. Yeah. It's further out. Mimico is between Toronto and Etobicoke. But now, Mimico is part of Toronto now? Y- well, it's really Queen Street West. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Okay. Like, And the other thing about this is... For, for those of you who don't know the geography, it's like Toronto is on an ocean because it is on a great lake. Mm-hmm. So it's either west, east, or north. Right, south, south is, is water. water. Yeah. And the whole city now, kind of the greater Toronto area, kind of curves along around the entire lake. And hugs it, yeah. Yeah. But at this point in time, it's out in the country. But it's only 10 miles. So... Biking out there is completely reasonable, and riding the motorcycle back is completely reasonable. Yeah. We just don't see the transition from big buildings to countryside. It's just he's now in the countryside. Well, it is also Canada, so if the moment you're out of city, you're in the country. Yeah. There's no in the middle. Yeah. It it is a weird thing that I've noticed here in the U.S. that because there's more people here and roughly the same amount of land, you get city... like. It's pretty much city from Indianapolis to Chicago or Indianapolis to Detroit. Mm. Like there are little periods of farmland, but not like it is in Canada where you can drive from Windsor to London and not see a house. Anything more than two stories. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's, so I'm going to call foul on something in this episode, which is Murdoch's reaction to that motorcycle. It's the Murdoch that we get to know later. Yeah. And we're not trying to spoil anything and we're not going to. He's clearly a very mechanical engineering minded guy. I think when he saw that for the first time, he would have been like, want one right now. Must have that. And he does that later with Thing. Yeah. But in this episode, he's like, wow, the, you, we can't have those. What if everybody had one? All the horses, blah, blah, blah. And I just don't think that's the reaction that... A, a better developed Murdoch character would have. And second of all, this is something people forget that at this point in time, there was a climate crisis and that climate crisis was pollution caused by horse manure. Oh gosh. It, must it was have horrific so bad. in cities in particular. Yeah. And so they were desperately looking for different modes of transportation that to would, get horses out of the city. The, the fact that it's called a horseless carriage, the car is called a horseless carriage, is because it's not that bad thing that is a horse. That's the selling point. Yeah. That there's no horse. Yeah. Because at this point, it was t- horrific in cities. And I love how Murdoch Mysteries completely goes over this entire thing. Oh, they even show horses, hooves, and, and carriage wheels on the road, and there's not a drop of manure anywhere, and they would have been knee-deep in it all the time, right? Pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> but they did have plumbing, They right? did have plumbing. So there's so that is not a factor, but like it, it would have been 50 years earlier than yeah. us in London. That was part of the issue, too. It's just the horses that are creating the problem. I also think this particular motorcycle is a little advanced. Advanced? <laughs> I think it's awesome. I would totally ride that thing. Oh, I do too, but I think that's like a 1910s motorcycle. Mm. You uh, know, anachronisms, whatever. The 1985, 1885 motorcycle that Dolmer uh, Benz created mm. is far more primitive. Yeah. <laughs> And I'll it, put that picture. It looks in like show. a bike with a motor strapped to it that you would certainly burn yourself on. Oh yeah, constantly, right? Because of where it's positioned, your legs would touch it all yeah. the time. So it created in 1885 by uh, Daimler Wagon. Yeah, like da- like Daimler Chrysler. Yeah, that's Got- him. Gottlieb Daimler and Wilhelm Murdoch. Maybach, sorry, in Germany, a first internal combustion engine petroleum fueled motorcycle. And they just, they um, had something close to chaps at the time that they wore to protect their legs mm-hmm. from the engine because you would have needed it. 
Then we get another anachronism. We get Julia listening to Gilbert and Sullivan on a disc, a vinyl disc, resin disc. Folks, welcome to Mark's Corner, because this is Mark's (laughs) Corner. I collect media instruments and media uh, devices from bygone eras. This means we have a lot of junk in our house. We have a number (laughs) of things in our house, including some things we don't know what they are. (laughs) This is too, it's a bit too early here. First of all, it's an Edison phonograph. The phonograph, though available, would not, was not widely available. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, it was. It's far more likely that she would have a cylinder. A cylinder. Now, the the caveat here is, and we don't learn this till lady a little bit later. But Julia is mint. She is far more mint than we realize. Yeah, her like, her family is, is not poor. Super. Like she knows everybody who's in the upper echelons of. That's society. what helps her get yeah. her position. I when think so. People too. would have been opposed to her. Her dad's a. Very well-known doctor, and that kind of greases the skids for her. So if if these were even remotely available, that kind of explains Murdoch's reaction. Because when he sees it, he's like in love with the phonograph. But then he looks over at Julia like, oh, that's a girl that I could love because she likes this kind of technology. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm just more impressed with her all the time. I just think it's hard to get one of these that is working that actually spins that is a cylinder one. The wax oh, I'm cylinder. sure. And the wax cylinders are, they basically self-destruct constantly. <laughs> like, yes. they're just not going to last. Uh, we have an academic that we know who, a friend of theirs came over to their house and had a very early recording on a cylinder and picked it up and it cor- collapsed in his hand. It just went. Disappeared in his yeah. hand. But 1906 is the earliest recording of the Mikado. Hmm. Three little girls from school are we? And I'm going to tell you, the Gilbert and Sullivan people know their discography. Of course they do. (laughs) Yeah, I think that is probably... We ran into that when we covered the the Midsummer that has the stage production of the Pirates of Penzance. Yes. (laughs) I I definitely... And I wrote my version of, I'm the very model of a modern major general. (laughs) Yes. So this was on cylinders too, not on records. Do you know why they moved from cylinders to what platters or round? No, other than just that they would have been easier to transport, I'm sure. It's it's easier to transport, plus it's easier to make. The cylinders are harder to press than the records. Oh, I can see that. Yeah. Records are so much easier to yeah. to uh now, I, and the other thing is we have to remember that at this point in time to record, they were setting up a wax cylinder and screaming into a, oh, yes. into a, <laughs> like a bell. Like literally screaming because they didn't have microphones. The, if, they, if they had any microphones, so had they the, were incredibly primitive. You had money. to make a noise loud enough to mechanically create. Well, and. And all microphone technology was involved in phones, yeah. not in anything else. Like people were like, "Why would you ever record music?" <laughs> so you can just go listen to it live all the time. Just a tiny little offset. My favorite thing, one of my favorite things about Indiana University is the oldest recording ever found was found here in oh. a book because somebody had created a tool that made waveforms of sound. Uh, as a written down thing Mm -hmm. and put it in a book and somebody found it in the book, scanned it in and they can, you can actually hear the oldest sound ever recorded. I'll put a link to it. That's amazing. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. It's from like early 19th century. You're like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm hearing this thing. That's incredible. Yeah. It's, it's rough. So it's kind of like the way um, uh, the stylus moves on like a, um, oh, the thingamabob that tracks uh, earthquakes. The seismograph. The seismograph or a polygraph, yeah. that kind of so stylus. So it's it that was kind a of thing that, that you turn the crank and it moved the piece of paper and yeah. you shout it into a bell and it moved this little membrane and needle. And then that paper went into a book. Paper went into a book and just within the last, <laughs> since we moved to Bloomington, they found it. <laughs> what is the sound? Is it somebody going? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> no, they're doing uh, like a nursery rhyme. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a very common thing to first record nursery Watson, rhyme. Watson, I need you. Yes. That's the so. phone, right? Yep. So Percy is stabbed. We know that he's stabbed with something like a stiletto. Yes. 
And we get to see Julia in the in action with her those awful that awful lung she puts on ice. I, I, ugh. Sawdust, pupae, pupae in the oh, wound. The pupae. Okay, body farms. Yeah, rate of decay, all that stuff. Everybody knows, you know, that entomologists really do study that kind of stuff to to time death and everything. She pulls those pupae out of that wound and puts them in a test tube in liquid. What is that liquid? I would say it's probably um, alcohol, alcohol, formaldehyde, formaldehyde, something to preserve them. Yeah. Something that would prevent them from living. Yeah. Something that would prevent Murdoch from then feeding them liver in his office and getting them to hatch. I'm assuming he got June bugs somewhere else. (laughs) No, that's supposed to be those. That's what he's. That's why he's timing no, them to yeah. see how long they take, so he knows how long the body's been there. It's a bit rough here with the bugs. Her stitches. Ah. Yes. Okay. I know she's not a surgeon. Not everybody learns to sew. Yeah. I understand that. Her stitches are rough. Yep. Like they are bad. We have a picture that we'll put in the show notes of those rough stitches. Oh my gosh, they look awful. Like. I realize they're not surgical stitches. They're not supposed to heal, but wow. <laughs> you could at least trim them a little closer. <laughs> they got like big waxy things sticking off of them. She says he was dead 36 to 48 hours. That's yeah. what she's guessing. Yeah. In my long history of Sarah, you Googled what? Yes. <laughs> Many times I have looked into this. I looked into it again, the state of rigor and how quickly it passes. Because yeah. at this point, we don't know that he's been maybe frozen, put on ice for a little bit, whatever. Yes. Because as soon as I see this body all folded up, I think, wow, that's going to be a challenge. To unfold. Because if he's got rigor, they're never going to be able to lay him now, flat. Now, doesn't rigor come in and then it disappears? Yes, and then it passes again. Yeah. And based on what I read, and I don't know how the freezing and the thawing would affect it, and... Whether he was frozen when he went in the box or whether they stripped him naked and then froze him in that position to prep him to go in the truck, I don't know. But general knowledge says it would have passed. And so he would have been flexible enough to fold up like that and flexible enough to unfold Well, when they got him out of the box. I'm glad Stabber Though they makes- do lift him out of the box in that position, which is also really impressive <laughs> that he can hold that position that while they pick him up. actor deserves an award. He must have been specific about where they could lift him. Yes. Like, you put your hand here and yeah. here, okay? Yep. Not an inch to the left, all right? I'm not getting violated. If you want to give a bunch <laughs> of backstory to a character, what do you do, Sarah? Um, interview them? Yes. <laughs> so they have to tell you their life story? This is the chief constable interviews Murdoch, and we get a couple of things. First, not only is he Roman Catholic, but he's from the Maritimes. And he's a lumberjack and he's okay. Yeah, so the lumberjack thing's a bit personal because, you know, everybody makes a joke that all Canadians are lumberjacks. My dad was also a lumberjack. Your dad was a lumberjack for a while. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and who, a trainman. He all worked, the stereotypical Canadian he, jobs, he, your dad and a farmer. Yep. He worked in a lumber camp up north. In Quebec, just like Murdoch. Not so, at that time, no, but soon gosh. after. But yeah. So Murdoch was, his mom died when he was young. Yep. He's estranged from his dad. Yes. And we learn why later. We learn he was, he decided to become a policeman after talking to somebody in the lumber camp about being a policeman. Five years a constable, three years a detective. And a year ago, his fiance died. Lisa Milner. Which makes you go, oh. Yes. Oh, you're Catholic. Goodbye. (laughs) Is that the glass ceiling? No, the glass ceiling is the ice that we see the killer through. You think so? That's all I got. (laughs) See, I think the glass ceiling is the ceiling preventing Murdoch from being promoted. I think it's part of it. It's like a papal ceiling. It's twofold. (laughs) I definitely think that it's twofold. It's a Vatican ceiling. Yes. (laughs) Papist. And that... Like, especially at this time, and there'll be more episodes later on about Orangemen versus Catholic and things like that. And even to my day in Canada, it was definitely something that came up. Yeah, so we know Brackenreed is a Protestant. Yes. But he has no problem with Murdoch. No. So Brackenreed's just a more progressive person. Well, I think Bracken, or practical person. I think Bracken Reed is very aware of the gem that he has, and yeah. he's going to keep it close to him. Yeah, well, and we see that in the last scene. He at least appreciates Murdoch enough to know that he's valuable to the police force, and that 
he should be promoted if he deserves it, regardless of his religion. I also think he's right. I don't think he would make a very good inspector. Mm -mm. No, I, he, I think Murdoch could be good at whatever he wanted to do, but it would take him away from the hands-on part of investigation. The He'd be a bureaucrat. Wants. Off we are to the Brackenreed household, and we find Mrs. Brackenreed. Margaret! Arwen Humphrey. She's great. I love this woman. We get to see a lot more of her. Yep. She doesn't even have a first name in this episode. Nope. Well, and according to the IMDB, and our friends maybe at the Murdoch Appreciation Society can tell us if this is true. Yes. According to IMDB, her character did not have a, a first name in the script. And Arwen Humphreys and Thomas Craig talked off set and decided her first name was Margaret. Yeah. Because later, when, when he wants her to take the boys away, he says, Margaret! Yes. And, he, and she comes in and grabs the son and, and pulls him away. They decided what her first name was. Yeah. That's what the IMDb fact says. I don't know if it's true or not. The boys are not named here. Us. Later on, they will be, of course. Yeah. But this is a, I think this is a really well written scene because you know what's in the case. And Bracken Reed knows what's in the case. And Murdoch knows what's in the case. And no one else does. So, first of all, the Bracken Reed's house is beautiful mm -hmm. their parquet floor is gorgeous yes i'm like drooling over their house second okay so i realized that trunks and big parcels of this size were a bit more common <laughs> back in the day but if somebody wanted to deliver that here with just a note on the top with my name on it what, how would you react well, would you be like put it in the parlor <laughs> doesn't she say she was out at the ladies' auxiliary and she came back and it was here? Then the maid let them put it in there, maybe? I guess. I, I would. You laugh, but I had a picture <laughs> delivered to the house and I didn't realize it was delivered for six weeks because our children accepted it and placed it in a hiding spot. Yes, that's true. I, these trunks, though, were not cheap. No. This is not like the equivalent of a cardboard box, no. right? It's got locks on it. It's a traveling trunk. Yeah. That is a major piece of luggage for the average person, not a wealthy person. The average person, that would be an investment. Yeah. To buy one of those. And now IOTS bought two. Yes. Right? Or stolen two. But this one has a judge in it. And we don't no. get to see his nudie bits. No. No, we don't. <laughs> we just get to find out. <laughs> they don't even open it. It's just like, yeah, and there was a body in that one too. My first impression, the first time I saw this was I thought it that it was that it was empty. That it was like it was the trunk for Bracken Reed. Oh yeah. Because you don't see who's in it. Yeah. And the note just says, guess who's next, Inspector? It doesn't say yeah. that I went to see the judge, right? So it's it's dissimilar from the first note. And so I thought, oh, this is the trunk for him. He's yes. next. Yeah. He's not next. Judge Henry Scott. So we go back to station four, and we find out more about Walter Iot. That he escaped from the Don jail after being put there by these three five years ago. So the Don Jail is on Gerard Street, 550 Gerard Street. Is it still there? West. Part of it still remains. But not as a jail. It was It was a, an amazing, absolutely stunning structure when it was first built. Why is it called Don? Uh, because it's right by the Don River. Oh, okay. And the Don Valley Parkway now, because it's the Don Valley. You have to go. Don is just such a weird name for a river. It's like naming a river Rick, <laughs> you know, or Bob. Uh, <laughs> what you like, there's a big sort of bridge there now. Yeah. And there would have had to have been at this point in time, at least over the river. But it was built originally in 1864. And there's different wings it was closed by the time that i had moved to toronto so it was a it was a prison it was yeah, big it was and it big. was in the city and this is where and later on we'll see this in future episodes this is where they hung people oh this is this is but not in public right they no would no have had it's an a inner place, courtyard. place of execution that was inside it was never even outside it was an interior place but you you could go tour the cells and stuff like that. I think you may still be able to do that now. They have a little museum. I think then it transformed into a hospital facility at some point. But I'll I'll tell you, like I lived in Cabbage Town when I moved to Toronto, and the first weekend I was there, I walked past this building. So was it like a groundbreaking kind of place? Was it like super modern when it was built? Like I think notably so. so. Not 
not to the point of being like a uh, reform oriented prison, like a. But it was just supposed to be more secure. Yeah, it's, than the average prison. It's there where they put the baddies to stay. And what's weird is it's it is what would we you would call downtown now. Yeah, like it's clearly downtown. So in the U.S., when you say jail, that is short term incarceration. That's like where you go between arrest and trial, or where you go if you receive a very short sentence, like you're in there for you know weeks. You don't go to prison; you stay yeah. in the jail. But you're saying that this was probably more like a prison. Yeah. And they built a wing for women eventually, too. Mm. So men and women were there. But, like, there's a picture of it on the Wikipedia page from the 1860s, and it looks like it's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Like in the middle of a field. But then the city kind of grew up around it. Oh, totally. Well known as one of the most haunted places in Toronto. Of course. It's like Alcatraz. So there was a riot and a jailbreak and a fire, and supposedly Ayat died... That he was burned to death and his body was identified as charred remains. Yep. But he's not dead, right? No. Obviously, because Birkins faked that so that he and Ayat could become compatriots. Yes. Now, why would Birkins have done that at the time? Did Ayat pay him a bunch of money? I don't know. I guess, because it's not like he had, he didn't even have his corn shard business then. I was waiting for Ayat's my half-brother or something like that. Like some reasoning why he would save him. Or Ayat had something on me already. That's another. And he blackmailed me. Like, Ayat's not a good dude. We wouldn't know because we only ever see him on ice. They go to the flop house and there is the incredibly. Well, they don't go there yet because they got to get the tip off about the flop house. And that comes from Delmer. Yes. So Delmer. So this is our introduction to Brackenreed taking things too far in the old school way. He's got his beating glove. Yep. The one leather glove that he wears just to beat people with. Yep. So his hand doesn't get damaged. Exactly. They do a very good job of not making police abuse a really, really sad topic that it is. <laughs> yeah. I think there's just enough yeah. to let us know this is not acceptable. It's not the way things are supposed to be done. And I don't want you. But it's also common. I don't want listeners to worry that this is, they deal with this and then it goes away. Yeah. It's, it's not a, I think it's a Bracken Reed change in character. Yeah. And which, I, and I think it's, it's Bracken Reed adapting to new police methods. Yeah. This is not how we do it anymore. Yeah. But he is so upset because his life is in danger. Yes. His family's life is in danger. Yeah. And so he, he does things that he knows probably aren't right. Yeah. I mean, just the way he tells the constables to go out and find anybody associated with Ayat and bring him in, like, he's losing his temper over this, which is understandable. Yeah. But, you know, Murdoch's got other ways to go about it. <laughs> and Murdoch's like, oh, maybe we shouldn't be people up. Yeah, maybe we should just go find his crash pad that's booby-trapped. Murdoch is so stupid here. He sees the tripwire and he sets it off. It could have easily been an explosive. It could have easily been an explosive. It could have been a b- b- bomb. They they said st- it. It's just a stiletto. They stand away from the door and he trips the wire and I'm like, kaboom! You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, here. yeah. So second of all, that's a pretty complicated mechanism. I'm impressed with it because it is a sprung trap. That is strong enough to fling that stiletto quite a distance, I'd say at least 10 feet and into wood. Yes. Yeah. It's a great bit of, great bit of filmmaking here because the thing actually doesn't fly. There's no flying thing. It doesn't, there's no shot of it flying. I looked at. I don't, no, there isn't, but I kind of think they had somebody throw it. I double checked. You it's think they just the stuck wa- it in the wall and then just wiggled it? It's in the wall when the shot starts. Okay, so, so they just stuck it in the wall, and then somebody thwonged it. Yep, like one of those door stopper things. But it's one of those things that you you forget about because we all understand the language of film. Yeah, you just fill in the blank. We just fill in the blank. <laughs> Murdoch's chalkboard is a running thing. I posted the. There is a really good picture of the first murder board I found online. I posted it to the show notes and to are real this week. But that's a murder board. What we get in this next scene is not a burner board. This is Murdoch listing places where there is sawdust. Yeah. 
<laughs> like you're going to use a whole chalkboard to write that down because they found some, Julia found sawdust in his hair. It says sawmills, carpentry shops, furniture manufacturers, construction sites, butcher shops. Like what's next? A bar. They used to put sawdust yeah. on the floor. Did you, know? you notice on the paperwork? Places where people whittle. Did you notice on the paperwork for IOT what his real occupation was listed as? Uh-uh. Mob. <laughs> He is a mob. He's a mob. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> He's a one man mob. Yeah. You must have a mouse in your walls. It <laughs> stinks in here. I love this. It makes me giggle way more than it should when Julia comes in and she's like, oh, hello. You called for me. Oh, what's that smell? Like her face turns inside out. She's George, like- did you fart in here? <laughs> George smells it and Murdoch's like, what smell? I don't smell a smell. And yeah. <laughs> and George is cool enough to go, well, he's my boss. If he says it doesn't stink, I'm not going to make a deal out of it. Julia has none such tact. And she walks in. She's like, Whoa! and she works with dead bodies and she thinks yeah. your office smells bad. It is bad. Yannick does such a good job of here playing a bad actor. Yes. <laughs> You're being a bad liar. He's being a bad liar. He's like, I, I don't smell anything at all. <laughs> When I first saw this, I thought he had gotten a whole pig carcass I and was rotting it in his office to see how long it would take. Of, but no, he has it in his special liver closet. <laughs> <laughs> but the first time she comes in, she's like, oh, it smells. And then she kind of gets over it. The second time she comes in, she's like, I can't take this smell anymore. We need to walk two feet out of the room. It's like she gets slapped in the face by it. There yeah. should be like a green haze in the air and Murdoch's just pretending it's not there. Yeah. <laughs> and Crabtree invents phone tracing. Yes. I love how Murdoch's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I'm like. No, I would like to hear about this, Tracy. Because <laughs> you're a nerd. Because I'm a telephone nerd, especially. There was a telephone episode coming up. <laughs> so the way exchanges worked was you physically unplugged something from one plug and plugged it into another appropriate plug, right? Yes. So what he's saying is he went to the operator and said, this call that was made several days ago, can you remember where... You plugged it in at. And miraculously, the phone oper- operator sits there and goes, hmm, 4.30 yesterday. This one. That's where I yeah. plugged it in. Now. Come on. Now. They'd handle hundreds and hundreds of calls an hour. Clara is the one who called. Percy's widow. Yes. Who, a day after her husband is found dead, is in her widow's weeds. Boom. Like, you got to keep them around, man. Like, she's got the widow outfit in the closet waiting so how old does a man have to be that you buy your widow's weeds? I think as soon as you get married, you get them just in case. Oh. People didn't live very long, that's you know? That's true. And so if you if you gained or lost weight, you'd have to update your widow's weeds so that you're ready. And you got to have nice block earrings to wear with it. Yeah. And a hat with a veil so people don't see that you've been crying. She's, she's kitted out. She's ready to go. So we know that Birkin has invented this motorcycle. And before that... <laughs> He invented corn shards, which may as well be like nutty blades or yeah. something. Like so cornflakes, Kellogg's, <laughs> yeah, that cereal. Whole thing. The whole beginning of cereal is very weird. Oh, yeah. It's a therapeutic, medicinal, Kellogg's a fruitcake weirdo. Thing to stop people from masturbating oh, and all yeah. sorts of really weird At stuff. At least Birkin is just like, hey, it's an easy to eat breakfast. It's but healthy. This, this is... One of these awesome scenes where it's George and Murdoch riffing on the future. Yes. Because <laughs> they're looking through books of patents. Like they went to the patent office and they were just like, sure, you can just have all the books. Take them with you. Bring yep. them back when you're done. Yep. No, they would not have done that. They would have said, you can sit down and look at them here. Before we start into the patents, I want to talk about one thing that gets said. Some, I think it's George says, you're a shoe in for this job. Mm-hmm. That is not a phrase that didn't come into the vernacular to the 1930s. Okay, so that's an anachronism. That's an anachronism. A shoe win, which is sure win, right? No, it has to do with horses and shoe. Oh, but no it's shoeing. but it's 40 years early. Yeah, it's okay. 40 years early. Are you ready to talk about patents? Yes, so let's talk about patents. Because they talk about the self-pouring teapot, which is just a machine <sighs> to scald you. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> the bicycle with lettering on the 
<laughs> what kind of message could you send in the mud? Like it would be the same message all the time, over and over See and you over later, again. Coppers, yeah. coppers, coppers, <laughs> coppers. Bye, losers. <laughs> in the mud. So I. Well, it wouldn't be mud as our, we discussed that's true. earlier. It would be uh, manure printing, yes. basically. <laughs> um, and I'm sure it would work real well in the snow. Yes. So I went down a deep, 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 like three hours deep rabbit hole into the Canadian patent office archives <laughs> looking for things that were also patented in 1895. Okay? okay. Now, everything I'm about to tell you comes from one year. One year. Of patents. Yep. And I have a quiz for you. Okay. So new listeners, <laughs> occasionally Sarah quizzes me on certain things, including we've done other all sorts of other weird and wonderful quizzes. So there's usually 10 of these. Is there 10? No, there's 13. There's 13. Because it was so difficult. <laughs> and Sarah usually mixes real and fake. Yes. And I have to tell real from fake. Yes. Okay. And and we will share this document because for the real ones, I have a link to each of the patents. I also, I also do either phenomenally well at these or really badly. <laughs> and it's just down to whether I'm convincing or not, I think. Yes, I think so. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about... So this is Canadian 19, 18, 18, 1895 patents. Yes. Wow, yes. that's specific. Specific, okay. Wow. okay. There were um, over 200 pages of patents. Oh, excellent. With, well, 200 pages of results. Okay. With like 50 a page, what? okay? I went through the first hundred. It was it was a time of invention. It was, absolutely. And a lot of these were co-filings where it was something that was filed in New York, and then the inventor went to Toronto and filed it there too. Because, you know, the border, they didn't want somebody in Canada to steal yep. their stuff, right? So they yep. filed it in both countries. These are either real or fake, and I'm going to tell you um, the name of the patent, which are incredibly vague, of course, by the way. And then I will describe it to you. Okay. And, and I'll you tell me it's whether it's a fake. real patent or a fake patent. Okay. 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 The first one is called detonating toy. Okay. All right. <laughs> it's a toy that looks like a hammer, but on the head of the hammer, it has a little cavity where you can put a detonating cap in that came with it. If you put one cap in and you hammer it against a, a solid surface, it makes a big bang yep. like a cap gun. Yep. But if you put two in, it will launch the hammer in a quote, amusing manner. Okay. I don't know if I've ever told you this. I did this. You hit caps from cap guns with a hammer. I right? uh, So I hit a cap with a cap gun with a hammer because when I was a kid, cap guns were a thing. And they the caps it's came like in a, like a strip of paper. A strip of paper with a tiny bit of some explosive thing. Gunpowder or something. On it. And you hit it and went bang. Yeah. Right? It was like, a, like those little snap things. Yeah. Right? Did I ever tell you what I did next? That you... Banged a whole roll of them. I or banged something? an entire roll. Yeah, and what <laughs> and happened? One, it was so loud I couldn't hear for an hour. Wow! It was it it was incredibly loud. I also did this inside. <laughs> did it launch the hammer in an amusing manner? I immediately dropped the hammer. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, what did I just do? <laughs> and, of course, my mother was like, what was that? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> What's this big black scorch mark on the floor? Nothing. I, oh, I did it on cement. On the cement floor, like in the yeah, basement or in something? in the basement. Yeah. Okay, so is this real or That's not? real. It is. Definitely It real. is. And it was called detonating toy. <laughs> All right, that's one for you. Okay. Okay, real or fake? A combination couch and casket. A chaise lounge for the parlor that can be converted into a casket when the base is removed and then used as a lid. Hmm. I'm going to say fake. It is fake. Sort of. Oh. I'll qualify that. Okay. There actually was a combination couch and casket, but it was a laying out couch for the purpose. Oh, okay. okay. But it is like a chaise lounge. Oh, nice. But it wasn't a piece of everyday furniture. No, oh, okay. So, Excellent. And and the, the base wasn't the so lid. So I'm two for two. The base wasn't the lid. Okay. But yes, two for two. Okay. An ice velocipede. Okay. Do you know what a velocipede no, is? No, I don't. A velocipede is an early name for a bike. Okay. It's a bicycle with a sled on the front instead of a wheel. Okay. Real or fake? That's real. It is. I absolutely. I don't know how well it would work, though. No. Like the back tire would have to have a lot of weight on it and 
be spiky having, or something. Having tried to ride a bike in winter conditions, yeah. It would be tough Yep, to get the traction. Okay, you're three for three. Good job. Oh, nice. The next one is a non-refillable bottle. It's a bottle that once filled cannot be filled again. What stops it from being filled again? The design of the bottle. Okay, I don't understand how this works, so I'm going to go fake. No, it's real. How does it stop from being filled again? Okay, so here's how they made, and I read the whole patent, by the way. <laughs> And they, they have these awesome, like, they have a description file, a drawings file, and then, like, a notes file. So yes. you can download the PDFs and, and actually read the original version of it. So if you can imagine a glass bottle, like a beer bottle, for example, yep. when they make it, the neck is made separately. So you have the body of the bottle and the neck. Yes. And in the base of the neck is a glass ball. So you fill the base of the bottle. And then you fuse the neck to the bottle. And when you want to open it, you have to poke something down in to separate that glass ball from the rest of the glass. Okay. And empty the bottle. And now it can't be refilled and stored. You can fill it, but it's got a glass ball in it. Yeah. That's going to take up a bunch of room because it's the width of the neck. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm thinking maybe there are some glass shards inside maybe. too, maybe. I don't want to drink. There was also some convoluted kind of fins inside the body of the bottle too. But what I don't understand is why they would want to make a bottle that couldn't be filled again. Because they want to sell more bottles. But take a, a deposit on them then. And maybe make it fresh. No. Maybe. I don't. I don't know. Now, the, the glass ball method of sealing a bottle still exists. But now the ball is at the top of the neck. Yeah. And you just push it down. A lot of like Japanese sodas have yeah. these now. And it goes down into the bottom and it just fits very tightly. Yes. It's not part of the glass. This no. you actually had to break it Oof. to make it go down. Somebody drank some glass. So you got that one right too. Yep. All right. These are not outrageous enough, apparently. Okay. I'm kind of getting more outrageous as we go. Okay. A baby powered roasting jack. Do you know what a roasting jack is? It's it's the thing. It's like a spit. Like a rotisserie. Yes. Yeah. And they had dog powered ones and they had. They definitely had dog powered ones. Clockwork ones, ones and, yep. you know, baby made, powered, made ones. powered ones. So this one, it's like a, ba- you know, the baby bouncing chairs. You put the yep. baby in and they can barely touch the ground and they kind of bounce around. But when the baby bounces, there's a. Um, a, a belt that goes down to the jack and it converts it to turn. So the baby's bouncing in the doorway and it's powering the roasting jack. I'm going to say that's fire. true. No, that's fake. I made oh, that one up. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> woo woo. Okay. Wig bang. Wig bang. This is a row of curls attached to a string that can be pinned to your forehead or inside your hat to give the impression of a row of curls right around your hairline. That's absolutely true. It is. It's true. And they This is lemon (laughs) might that in Poirot. (laughs) They were advertised more to men than women. Oh really? Because you could pin them in your hat. Okay. Your your bangs were attached to your hat. Oops. Take your hat off. Whoops. Good job. Okay. This one is just called Water Closet Addition. Okay. Addition. A-D-D. Okay. It's a pad of paper toilet seat covers. I'm calling them toilet seat covers. Okay. With advertising printed on them. And they could be used either as a seat cover or as toilet paper or both. That's true. It is. That's a bad invention. <laughs> it's a bad place to put advertising. It's a bad place to put advertising. Unless it was to advertise for that product. Maybe. Like, yeah. Even then. But if you go to a bathroom now that has toilet seat covers, they're in like a box on the back wall and you yeah. pull one out and yeah. you put it over the seat. This was a pad of toilet seat covers that sat on the seat. And you just, and you just ripped one off. No, no. I'm so sorry. <laughs> all there is between your butt and the next butt is a thin sheet of paper. No. You could put advertising on it, Mark. Yeah. All I right. Guess. How about a toy marble shooter? It's a gun for shooting marbles to make the game more fun for less skilled players. True. It is. Yeah. It was spring loaded, but it looked just like a pistol. All right. How about an ice hunting tripod? Ice so this is a belt 
that you put around your waist and it has three metal bars that extend out from your body and on the bottom of them are inverted metal dishes that sit on the ice that serve as outboard balances so you can shoot while standing on ice. Yes, that's a true thing. I made that up. Oh, nice. They did have ones for water though. Oh, okay. That was real. I made up for the ice. Oh, nice. I think the ice one makes more sense, except I I think when you shot, you'd go backwards. Also, I'm not sure if hunting seasons are in winter. Sure. Usually have hunting seasons in the spring. Did they really have seasons back then? They just know. shot stuff when they wanted to. Who didn't knows? they? That one's one for me. Man, I've only got two points now. Okay, corn holders. Wooden spike handles for holding hot corn on the cob. True. We have those now. Yeah, but do you think they were invented in 1895? Yes. They were. Man, that one's not very good. There were a lot of hot corn inventions. Really? Yes. Hot corn was a thing. Apparently, it was a big thing. Oh, okay. Like, have you ever seen the the dishes for corn on the cob? So you, you put the butter, and it's like a boat-shaped dish. Yep. You put the butter in it, and then you roll your yeah. corn. The, like, those, the patent for those was in 1895. Oh, I think okay. it was the same guy. Same he was very he into was corn. 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 Corn on the cob guy. Like corn shards, too. Okay. How about an extendable casket? It has a section in the middle that's adjustable to make it longer no, or shorter. That's that's fake. No, that's real. What? Why would you do that? Because people reused caskets. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ooh. You could make it up to two feet shorter. Oh. So it could go from like six feet to four feet, even suitable for a child. Oh, okay. That's a point for me. Yep. <laughs> Unfortunately. How about a classroom behavior improvement device? This is along the long line of if you add electricity to it, it's good. Yeah. I saw patents for electric corsets, electric hats, electric bras, you name it. This is a series of seat cushions for student desks that are wired together with a control board on the teacher's desk. You flip a switch to give a specific student a shock. True? Nope. I made that one up. Oh. (laughs) Though... I wouldn't be surprised if somebody had come up with it and just couldn't get a patent for it because they seem to be willy nilly shocking each other. I saw a patent for a folding chair that could give you shocks because that's funny, Mark. Yes. You trick your friends. You shock them. Yes. You electrocute them. It's funny. Okay. The last one is another casket invention. It's a sliding top for a casket. It's a jointed wood sliding top, kind of like a roll top desk. You know how they yeah, I, I slide totally down? I totally see that as true. So that over the top of yeah. a casket. Yeah. It is true. Man. I did pretty well. I only got four. Oh. You got nine. Nine. Good job. Nice. There were some crazy things in there. I can imagine. That I'm... I was so tickled when I realized that they had the drawings that were filed. Yes. As a PDF, so you could look at the drawings. Yeah. Man, there must have been big business in technical drawing at this time. Oh, I can imagine. Because some of the patents were handwritten and some were typed. Yeah. But all of the drawings were really high class. I did see a patent for a, a teletype machine that anybody could use. So instead of sending Morse code by tapping on the thing... You could press a button that represented a letter, and it would automatically yeah. There was a send lot the of there was a lot of telegraph machines like that. Yeah, at this it was point telegraph. Time. Chief Inspector comes to see Bracken Reed and is a little bit religious. <laughs> He's just a jerk. Yeah, you could be an alderman or maybe mayor, but this is a Protestant city, and Bracken Reed calls him a prick under his breath. After the inspect, the but it's stunning to me that him. he said prick. Um, what did were they? Did they think that that Catholics were like witches or immoral or just different? The they're they, just other people. They're just different. The, the biggest issue, I think, and I don't want to even deem this as like. But I mean, I what know. was what was the stereotype they the would have stereotype used to justify was it? That they were more enamored with the Pope than they were the Queen. Ah, or the okay. King. So their allegiance might have been to the wrong the wrong person, which is their loyalty. followed Roman Catholics into the time of John F. Kennedy. Yeah, yeah. And and would that have been something that um, that the chief would not have been embarrassed to say? Oh, not like, at all. I mean, not he doesn't seem shy about saying no. it to Brackenreed. Not at all. Not at all. It, so it wouldn't have been something that you said on the quiet. 
No. I wonder what he would have told Murdoch if he had been there. Like if the chief would have just said, I'm sorry, but you're a Catholic. So he might can't. have said that. Wow. He, and he might have called him just a papist. Wow. Murdoch drives his bike on the sidewalk. Yes, I made I that note like too. It. And I don't I, like it. <laughs> I don't think Murdoch would have liked it, would he? No, I don't think so either. He also has a bike light that appears and disappears yes. in this episode. It's a cool bike light, though. It is a cool bike light, but it appears and disappears. And next, we go out to the farm, which is now subs- out in Mimico, is completely empty, and we have the birth of a brand new thing. Murdoch's motorcycle gang. Yes. Well, he leaves Crabtree behind. Yes. He's it's like a gang of one. I'm going to get on the motorcycle. You get on your bike. I'll see you later. So he must leave his bike there then, right? Yeah. So, so does this, he get to keep it? I guess. So this is <laughs> He over, has it in his office later. A, nine or ten miles. You, know. it, you would have made it much faster yeah. on the, the motorcycle. Yeah. And we get our first action Murdoch here. But this is not what an ice house would look like. No. It wouldn't just be a walled-in area in the middle of a barn, right? It would have been mm. underground, like a cellar, Something right? like that. I never understood how the whole ice works, like ice houses work. Just Why doesn't everything just melt? Insulation. Yeah. Right? So, and you would lose, like, I mean, they used to put big blocks of ice on ships, right? Yeah. So they would take it from the lake, they would cut it into cubes, <sighs> they would put it on a ship, and they would know that by the time they got it where they were delivering it, that half of it would be gone. Yeah. And they would just pack accordingly. They would just yeah. take that much more ice than they needed. But if you were wealthy at this time, you would have an ice house, but it would be like a subterranean like a hobbit hole, basically, yeah, filled with sawdust and cubes and big blocks of ice. And the bigger the block, the slower it will melt, right? Yeah. And it's surrounded by other ice, so the whole thing is going to be cold. Julia has ice in the morgue. She puts the fake lung on the ice. Yeah. <laughs> George yes. <is> Julia. <laughs> yeah, it might be the coldest place in town. Yeah. Um, I'll just keep this motorcycle in my office. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ayat is under the ice. And like we get to see him just for a second looking up yeah. and it's so brief that I can't even tell if it's a real person. Yeah, I can't tell either. Under I, a big I piece of plastic, look. but I it's well to. done. Yeah. I mean, just a glance, we can see yeah. that he's under there. But now we know that Birkins isn't just, you know, kind of a, a bloodthirsty in, investment guy. He's not just an inventor. He's a killer. He is a killer. A yep. cold. I mean, he he put somebody's body under the ice in his barn, the ice that his family would use yeah. for food and stuff. He's got a body hidden underneath it. Like he's, he's wandered into serial killer territory now. It's, it's definitely minimized how these two criminals are horrific human beings. Well, and when they can, and when Bracken Reed confronts him, he gets a scalpel out. Like what's his plan? I don't know what his plan is. I'm going to take Bracken Reed out, at least slow him down so I can get away, and then... Be on the run? For the rest of his life? From the Murdoch motorcycle gang. <laughs> the one man... Well, I was a mob. Yep. And Murdoch is a gang. Yes, I There guess. you go. Yeah. <laughs> I, my notes just say, motorcycle, vroom! <laughs> <laughs> so we have the last scene, which is really the greatest character development in the whole episode. Mm-hmm. And makes it make the most sense as the first episode instead of last week's episode. Yeah, because we've seen Bracken Reed be protective of his family, but we've also seen him be supportive of the men who work with him, but also sort of abusive of those men. We we've seen him be cruel to a prisoner. Yeah, and we see- and now we get to see him being really thoughtful. Yeah, because so he- instead of delivering the papist message. Yep. He says, you you don't want that job anyway. I'll, I'll withdraw your application. Don't worry about it. Yeah. He instead can, of saying the chief is Murdoch. That, instead of saying the chief is a jerk. I And I'd like you to reconsider. Yeah. I, I need, need you to stay you. around. But I'm not going to give you a raise. Do you think Murdoch knows? Um, No. I do. I think Murdoch knows enough about how he's treated in the city that he likely suspects it and goes along with the inspector here because it's like, yeah, I think maybe we should break up, you know? <laughs> I'm just going to act like it was my idea, too. Like when you said, when you when the other person says, I think we should break up, you say, yeah, I think that's a good idea, <laughs> even though you clearly don't. Well, if... If we think that Murdoch knows the truth behind what Bracken Reed's saying, 
maybe at least he's thought through that that Brackenreed has warned him about the politics. Yeah. And and Murdoch knows that part of those politics are him being Catholic and yep. the complications that that would add. And now that he's thought about it a bit more, he's like, yeah, I don't want to deal with that because I like what I do. Yep. Maybe. Or you could say that Murdoch wears rose tinted glasses, that he thinks the best of everybody, and he genuinely thinks that Bracken Reed wants him to stick Which around. Which is also kind of true. Yeah. So I think it could go either way, but we're not given a clear indication. Do we even need to talk about Best Corpse? Best Corpse is clearly, it may be Best Corpse of this season, maybe of the show in its entirety. Is Pollock. Yeah. Period. Percy Pollock. Naked dude, folded up in a trunk. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Winner. After the credits. Well, who's going to take over the motorcycle business? There are a lot of widows again. <laughs> like yeah. in the last episode. Well, no, there's just one. Percy's widow, because the judge wasn't married. Judge He's was, just got a secretary. Yeah, he was married to that secretary oh, secretly. Oh, well, she loved him. She, loved she took him. care of him. Yeah. But other than that... I mean, Delmer is is beat up. His teeth are crooked already. So you know, yeah. uh, he's just going to go back to being a low life. A mob. Yes, Ayat's dead. Yep. And Birkins is definitely going to go to jail. And Henry appears again. This is true, Henry. This is this this, this smirky, disrespectful of authority. Yep. With a smile, Henry. It's just so classic, like. They did so many things that are right in these first two episodes. Because they know where they're going. Yeah. Right? So yeah. they can they can foreshadow that kind of stuff. Okay. And <laughs> Mrs. Brackenreed, we don't we don't get to see her say, wait, what was going on? Because she would have What easily. was in that trunk? Yeah. In she, my house? Yes. With my children? Yes. Thomas. Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> I love her so much. That's after the credits is Brackenreed gets the, I'm so glad you're okay and you're alive and the bad guy's dead. Now, I'm going to tell you what for, because you did what and you didn't tell me and this was going on and you didn't tell me and, ah, uh, you yeah. know, that's that's how I would feel. So that is the glass ceiling. Yes. Which is really Pope ceiling. Pope ceiling. <laughs> or ice ceiling. I think it's Pope ceiling. I think it's Pope ceiling. <laughs> What's next? What is episode three? Episode three is The Knockdown. It's a boxing episode, and it will be released from us on the 6th of March. Yes, because March is almost here already. I can't believe how quickly things are going. And time always passes. The older you get, the faster it goes. That's just how it is. Oh, boy. I, I, I like this episode more than I remembered. I forget how good it is. Yeah. I do. And how fun it is. And, and Julia. Oh, what is that smell? Oh, <laughs> that face. <laughs> it's so good. And we have so many good episodes coming up. We oh, and in the next two weeks, if that, in the next week, there will be a new design up in our store. Yes. That is Bracken Reed. I'm almost done with it. Yes. So when we sell our merch, just for those of you who are new. All the money goes to charity. We all, all make a dime off of it. And we, and usually we usually match it too usually when match we donate it. We donate to charity and we have clever designs up that relate to the shows that we cover. So this will be our first Murdoch design. Yes. And it's all Bracken Reed all the time, baby. All Bracken Reed all the time. Yeah. All right. Until next time. Bye, maniacs. Bye, maniacs. Oh, what is that smell? <laughs> They had, they had adolescent boys running the phone exchanges. That would have been a completely different scene. Needless to say, this did not work out well. There would have been a lot of... <laughs> in there the background were, of every one of your calls. There was many fist fights and prank calls. 